Hey, good morning, church. We are talking about, in these couple of weeks, we're talking about the launch of the church that happened on the day of Pentecost with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. So last week, Sunday, we kind of celebrated that fact. And in fact, on Sunday as well, last week, I woke up early and uh, Benjamin was up early and we watched a replay of the SpaceX launch of the astronauts to the International Space Station, which was quite exciting. And as I was watching that, I was thinking, man, it's quite a graphic picture of this launch of the church in that there was this tremendous release of energy that came on Pentecost to launch the church and then it kind of just gathered momentum for centuries since. So Ben and I were just kind of watching that speed dial just go up and up and up uh, and that's what's been happening with the church. It has been gathering momentum for centuries where now today we celebrate two and a half billion people call themselves Christians. It all happened at the beginning beginning with that launch of the church. So that's what we're talking about for these couple of weeks. Last week, uh, I started by really looking at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So after the Spirit came, Peter went outside to the people gathered around. It was a crowd of people had gathered. It was a whole bunch of people in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. So guys from all over the world, um, different nationalities, some spiritual seekers, some skeptics. And Peter gets gets out and he preaches to this crowd standing there. Uh, and the sermon is, well, it's a pretty short sermon, maybe it takes about 10 minutes. He has three Old Testament quotes. So one from Joel, which I focused on last week, and then two quotes from the Psalms. And he gives this sermon to this crowd that has gathered there. And uh, what we read is that the people were cut to the heart and said, brothers, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. When we read that 3,000 people were saved, were added to the church that day, which is kind of every preacher's dream. We like all imagine that that is going to happen every time we preach, that thousands are going to be saved, right? Peter set a pretty high standard uh, for us there. So today I want to focus on Peter's second reference to the Old Testament to Psalm 16. And the reason I want to do that is because I believe that this reference to Psalm 16 will teach us about the Holy Spirit and what it means in our lives. Now, you might think that that's a kind of a strange thing to do because these Psalms that he quotes in his sermon don't directly refer to the Holy Spirit. But Peter is bringing them up on this day where the Holy Spirit kind of first arrived on earth with the disciples. He brings it up in the context of this day to be sure Mostly his reason for doing that, if you look at Psalm 16 and Psalm 110, is to show that Jesus, whom they had crucified, was the predicted Messiah because he was resurrected from the dead. So that's his primary aim. But listen, Peter could have done that by quoting just one verse from Psalm 16, but he quotes a few verses from it. And it's not like Peter was just looking for more sermon material. No preacher ever needed more material. We need less, right? Uh, and so he's using that, I believe, in the context of the arrival of the Holy Spirit to introduce us to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit as we see it in these references to these Psalms. And I think you're going to see this when you see the very first line of his quote of Psalm 16 and see how it just really does connect to what we know about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's have a look. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, uh, midway through Peter's sermon. So reading from verse 22. And he says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, and here's the reference to Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, 
for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell with hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So the very first line of Peter's quote of Psalm 16 comes to life when you think about the Holy Spirit. Right? I saw the Lord always before me. So David's not, he's not meaning this literally. He didn't literally have a picture of God standing before me. What he was speaking about is the sense that God was always in front of him, going before him, helping him. And the psalm is in the context of God helping uh, in what was probably a very difficult circumstance, which is exactly the same idea one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to be the very presence of God with us, before us, at our side, behind us, surrounding us, in us. So in John chapter 14, when Jesus talks about that day when he would send the Holy Spirit, he says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever. Which is why Jesus said that it is to your advantage. He says to the disciples, it's to your advantage that I'm going away because when I go away, I will send the Spirit who will be with you forever. Now listen, have you ever thought about that? And just imagine what it would be like to the very presence of Jesus beside you all the time. And Jesus was saying to his disciples, no, 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 it's better that I go away because the Holy Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. That's the very presence of God. So when David said, I saw the Lord always in front of me, it is this idea of the Holy Spirit will be the very presence of God around us forever. So do you see how this first line of a quote from Psalm 16, which is not directly about the Holy Spirit, comes to life when we think about the Holy Spirit, what we know about the Holy Spirit. Or how about this next line? And this is really the only line that I want to focus on for the rest of the sermon. Just have one point to make about this one line. So listen to it again, thinking about perhaps the idea of the Holy Spirit. So he says this, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. So I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. So we're going to dwell here just on this one phrase, this idea of the right hand of God. And you might think, well, that's like really peculiar to focus on that one phrase. But listen to how many times this idea of the right hand comes up in Peter's sermon. That's the three times. So verse 32 to 33, he says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So there's a connection between Jesus being at the right hand of God and the giving and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to explore that. And then the very next two lines, he says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. So there he's quoting Psalm 110, which incidentally also includes this idea of the right hand. So that's what we're going to talk about. What does it mean when the Bible uses this phrase, the right hand of God? And in fact, as we look at Peter's speech, there's actually two ideas here. There's the right hand of God, and then there is our right hand. And what does that mean? How do they connect? 
And what I want to show you is how that connects to our understanding of the Holy Spirit. So let's just start with this idea of the right hand of God. It comes up a lot in Scripture. You can't miss this. About 150 times in the Old Testament is this repetition of the idea of the right hand of God. And it's used always to describe God's actions on earth. So it's like it's almost like God is right-handed, right? Because it's it's it out of that space that he acts. That's the metaphor here. And you'll see it all over. God's actions on earth is used this metaphor of his right hand is exercising his rule among his people. So for example, Exodus chapter, 15, uh, chapter 15, after the Israelites have crossed the Red Sea, they sing this amazing song of deliverance. And a couple of times in that song, it says things like this in verse 6, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. It's often used like that, your right hand, you reached out with strength and shattered the enemy. So God's right hand acts in power to rescue, to deliver from difficulty. That's often how the phrase the right hand of God is used. But it's not always used just to refer to God's power. It's also used to refer to his activity in blessing, in bringing blessing, in bringing joy. So have you ever thought about this? It's really curious how in the Bible, you know, in the stories of the patriarchs, where there would be this moment where they would infer a kind of um, inheritance or blessing to the firstborn, right? And so, for example, you have um, Jacob, Israel, who now is blessing Joseph's sons or his grandsons. And so Joseph brings his sons Ephraim and Manasseh. And, uh, and Joseph lines them up in the oldest to the youngest and, and puts the one by his right hand and the one by uh, Jacob's left hand, the oldest at, you know, at, at the at the right and the other at the left. And we read in that story that Jacob crosses his hands and he intentionally puts his right hand on the younger son, not the older, because he wants to confer that blessing of the firstborn to the secondborn. Just this really interesting moment where he's saying that God is going to use him in a bigger way. But he literally crosses his hand because the right hand was the right hand of blessing. And so when the Bible speaks about God's right hand, it's not just his power in delivering. It's also as he extends and confers his blessing and inheritance, which is why in Psalm 16, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, it says this, that, uh, you make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore. The right hand is used as this place, God's power, but also it's the place where he dispenses his blessing and joy and inheritance of those beautiful ideas. And then it's also his power, blessing, but it's also the place where God acts to rescue from sin. And again, really interesting here. I mean, the Old Testament, the priesthood as they made these sacrifices. And if you've picked up on this, but it's just kind of weird. They would make these sacrifices. An animal uh, would be sacrificed and the priest would take the blood from the animal. So curious. He would put some blood on his, the tip of his right ear and his right thumb. And then offer the sacrifice. You know, what on earth? <laughs> Why the right why the right side? Because that is the place where God acts, where he acts in power, where he acts in blessing, and where he acts to deliver us, to rescue us from our very sinfulness. Now, when Peter, in his sermon, brings up this idea of the right hand of God, he's thinking all these things. It's there in the Old Testament. But as he applies them to Jesus, what he's saying is that as Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, what that means is it is only possible because of Jesus that we as broken human beings, as people outside of the kingdom of God, can experience God's deliverance, his 
powerful rescue in our difficult circumstances. It's only through the sacrifice of Jesus that we can inherit the blessings of belonging to the kingdom of God and the family of God. And it's only through Jesus that we experience God's ultimate protection. In other words, Peter's drawing together this idea. It was always the heart of God to protect, to reach out and protect and deliver from calamity. And it was always the heart of God to bless, to bestow blessing and joy and fruitfulness. And it was always the heart of God to rescue us from our sinful brokenness. That's the heart of God the Father. But it's the sacrifice of God the Son that makes those things accessible to us. And now listen here. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, that applies God's rescue, His sacrifice leading to our deliverance from sin, and His blessing. It's God the Holy Spirit that applies that to our lives. So God intervenes. And we need to remember this these days, days of crisis and difficulty. God intervenes to rescue us through these days, the Holy Spirit made possible by Jesus the Son. And God's heart and His intention is to deliver us from our sinfulness through the Holy Spirit that convicts us and shows us Jesus. And it is God's intention to bless and restore us from our brokenness and leave us in these ways of fruitfulness and flourishing. But it is through the Holy Spirit made accessible by the sacrifice for humanity by Jesus, the Son. It's the Holy Spirit that does those things, applies it in a very real way in our lives. So that leads me to talking about the right hand, our right hand. See, because here's what happens often when we talk about these things. I know you know these things. I'm pretty sure if you've been around church for a while, you know these things. Or maybe you're new to church, and that's amazing. You're hearing this for the first time, but you know this, but often this is what we do. We go, yeah, God's heart is to bless. His heart is to restore. It's to rescue. God does that for people, but we, He doesn't do that for me. For me. Or maybe you don't actively think that. You don't actively think He's doing it for everyone else, but He's not going to do it for me. But you, we do miss out on actively receiving this that God wants to do. He wants to do these things in your lives. But we see it out there as God for people. We don't really receive it to ourselves personally, which is where this idea of our right hand now comes in. That's the right hand of God. That's what it means in the Bible, all of those things. Now, what about our right hand? So, so here in Psalm 16, David refers to his own right hand. So I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken, which is just a great verse on its own. Like he's at my right hand that I may not be, I think one of the translations says upended. <laughs> like I'm going to be okay because God's at my right hand. So that means something different. He's referring to God is at my right hand. It's meaning God is my defender. He's, yeah, he's, he's going to defend me. He's not talking about his action to defend others. He's saying God is at my right hand to defend me. And you'll read that all over the Bible. God at my right hand as my defender. So, for example, the classic Psalm 121 says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Have you ever thought about that phrase, the, the Lord is your shade on your right hand? What, what's so amazing about shade on your right hand? It's like God you know, is trying to keep you cool. Like He's there and He'll like keep you cool on just the right side of your body. No, it's referring to this idea of shadow. His shadow is cast on your right side. That the classic Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It's this idea of God is looming beside us and his shadow is cast down on our right side to defend us. But again, the right hand metaphor is not just about power. And it's not just about intervention to rescue and deliver us. It's also about intimacy. So, for example, Psalm 73 says, Nevertheless, God says, 
I am continually, uh, 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 the psalmist says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. It's, it's literally this picture of God holding at my right hand side, holding my right hand, which, I mean, let's be honest, that's, for some people, that's kind of uncomfortable to think about God in, the, in that intimate sense. I mean, holding hands is so intimate. I mean, especially these days when like, you know, social distancing and, and no contact. I mean, I'll never forget the first time that I held Kristen's hand. So we were up on this kind of, it's a, it's a prayer hill in, in Edenvale, special church as this prayer station thing. And you can sit up there and pray, which sounds all super spiritual, like to Kristen there to pray or really just want an excuse to hold a hand if i'm honest probably and i remember forget around that first moment like holding hand just like how thrilling that was which i mean it's uncomfortable to think about you know god in that sense but i mean even think about these days for me one of the greatest things is like holding the hand of benjamin or emma rose who's walking now it's such a sign of intimacy, of trust, of connection. This is how the Bible often talks about God at my right hand, holding my right hand. So he's not just looming, powerful shadow. He's there, yes, to protect, but at the same time, holding my hand. See, again, this is the idea of the Holy Spirit in our lives applying God's protection. Literally, the Holy Spirit intervenes on a daily basis for us, protecting. It's God applying His powerful protection through the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, He's not just a, not just a cosmic bouncer for us. It's holding our right hand. It's the sense of intimacy. And with that relationship of intimacy comes this protection. So do you see how this idea of God's right hand, so big, and yet it comes down to us in such a personal way. It's like God's right hand extends to my right hand. I want to try to connect these ideas, the right hand of God and all that that means, and God at my right hand, and intimacy, and all that that means. How do you connect these two ideas? It turns out, it's ridiculously simple. It comes down to something that I have really missed during lockdown. And that is the simple act of seeing somebody, and approaching them, friend, and extending your hand for a good old handshake. So I listened to a podcast the other day and all the things that will change after lockdown and uh, how life will be different. And the guy was saying, Christian guy, and he was saying, oh, he just loves the fact that when we get back to church one day, there'll be no more handshaking, you know? And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's exactly what I'm looking for, looking forward to is this kind of, you know, handshaking. So just think about that. That's a shaking of hands is this idea of the right hand of God reaching down, he's offering his right hand to us that comes with a significance of power, of rescue, of deliverance. All these Old Testament pictures, it wasn't just for them. God is read offering a hand of power to us, offering this hand of blessing. You read all those stories of the patriarchs, it's not just for them. He's extending that same hand to us. And is that same hand, that place of rescue from sinfulness, from brokenness, of restoration. God is extending his hand. And our response is to reach out and gratefully accept his hand. Right? We're not coming to God like on equal terms, like two friends meeting each other at church and shaking hands if they haven't been able to do that in a long time. No, it's, it's God extending and offering His right hand. And it's us gratefully reaching up and grabbing it. Now, here's what I love about this metaphor of right hand and right hand. And in my mind, the only way that connects is this handshake. Here's why I like the handshake metaphor. Because handshake also is used to describe covenant. You know, like we'll shake hands on it. Like back in the day, that meant something. 
Like there was an agreement. You shook hands to make an agreement. And so when God extends his hand, all that that means, and as we reach up and gratefully accept it, remember, when we do that, we're making an agreement. It's a sign of covenant. It's a sign of, yes, a gratefully accepting entrance into the kingdom of God and the family of God that comes with all of these blessings, protection, providence, rescue. But at the same time also comes with responsibility. Right? Responsibility to start behaving like people in the family of God and citizens of the kingdom of God like they would behave. And so I want to just leave that picture with you, this picture of this kind of divine handshake which really is just trying to connect together this big view of the right hand of God, his action, his intention to act on our behalf. And this very personal idea of our right hand. And as we reach and as that connection is made, that's the Holy Spirit applying to our personal lives all that God has ever intended for humanity in this whole spectrum of ways. And I hope and pray that today, that if you've never experienced that before, that you would see God reaching down and you would take that step to reach out and make that intimate agreement that comes with so much. So let's pray. God, we, we thank you today as we just think about your intention for humanity that we've seen record of through the Old Testament. And God, I confess and we confess that so often we just think that those were stories of past or they apply to other people and not to us. That God, through your Holy Spirit, would you just bring to our hearts this realization that you intend that for us to deliver, to protect, to rescue, that you intend for us to bless that everlasting joy would be found in your presence and that you intend to rescue us from our brokenness. May that come alive, Holy Spirit, when we see that intention today. That at the same time, would we know that that's for me, for us? And as we reach up and take hold and connect, Holy Spirit, with that connection, that covenant agreement, release all that was made accessible by Jesus to us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.